while Lamb's natural environment is confined to a relatively narrow zone of air extending not more than a few thousand feet above sea level. His innate inquisitiveness has led him to invent ways by which he can explore and develop other environments and other worlds. Right ahead to equalize this colliding valve, keep the code ready for the water. Right in the water! The science of diving is a prime example of this inventive and of man's determination to extend the horizon of nature gave. But while man can almost emulate the fishes in this underwater world, his basic bodily structure and its essential requirements remain the same. Next driver, next to the lever. Driver 1, this is Control, are you well? I'm there. Understood. Driver reports well. Good. Hazards will therefore always be present. <laughs> and uncompromising vigilance will always be an absolute necessity in such an alien environment. Driver appears to have any breathing problems, checking the diver. Driver 1, this is control, are you well? Driver failing, transfer the car. Wait, stand by, driver! Because of the rigid discipline which the naval driver has imposed upon him, serious diving accidents are very rare. But nevertheless, things can go wrong for a wide variety of reasons even for the well-trained side. Prevention is definitely the most effective approach, and diving accidents are avoided by good diving practice, which has evolved from an understanding of the physical rules which apply to diving. You all right, George? No, I'm not sure what I saw. What's up with that? Is he all right? It's a bit short of breath. He'll be all right in a minute, though. Well, that's right. You're okay. Well, let's get you settled, then. This program is therefore about okay. diving safety. Right. It is about understanding a few important principles of physics and physiology which come into play during every dive so that the diver can cope effectively and safely in an environment which his body has not been designed. from the air around us, which is made up approximately of 21% oxygen mixed with 79% nitrogen. In the process of breathing, air is carried along a tree of gradually narrowing tubes until it reaches a system of air sacs called alveoli, located at the end of each tiny tube. The alveoli are surrounded by a network of very fine blood capillaries, and it is here that the body extracts oxygen from the air that is breathed. In a process called external respiration, molecules of oxygen taken into the lungs diffuse from the alveoli into the blood where they are taken up by red cells and transported to tissues all around the body. While oxygen is diffusing out of the alveoli into the blood, carbon dioxide, which is one of the waste products of the body's metabolism, is diffusing from the blood and into the alveoli from where it is exhaled during the normal breathing cycle. Exhaled air therefore contains less oxygen and more carbon dioxide than inhaled air, while the nitrogen content remains essentially the same. While the process of external respiration takes place in the lungs, internal respiration takes place in the body's tissues, such as in this muscle. Oxygen in the blood has been brought by the pumping action of the heart from the lungs to the tissues, where it diffuses out of the blood and is taken up and used by the tissue cells. At the same time, the carbon dioxide waste, produced by the tissue cells, 
diffuses into the blood and is carried back to the lungs for exhalation, as we have previously seen. During exertion, the muscles involved will need more oxygen in order to function, and by speeding the action of the heart and respiration, the body ensures that more blood, and therefore more oxygen, is delivered. On the other hand, when muscular activity becomes minimal, when the body is at rest, the heart and lungs slow down again in accordance with the lower level of oxygen demand. A physically fit person can therefore perform all manner of tasks, almost without thinking about it. The heart and lungs adjusting their supply of oxygen to the tissues according to the changes in the body's needs. Although we are usually unaware of it, the oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere around us exerts a fairly constant pressure upon our bodies, and this atmospheric pressure, as it is called, is measured as one bar absolute at sea level. There are a number of air-filled cavities in the body which are important for the diver. They are the ears, the sinuses, the lungs, and to a lesser extent, the stomach. Pressure in these cavities is in equilibrium with the surrounding at one bar absolute because they all naturally connect with the body's exterior. Okay, Mark, another round, ready for the dive, three. Now that we have described the basic physical and physiological factors which affect the human body okay, in its normal the environment the at one bar right. absolute, we should now try to understand the effects of increasing and decreasing pressure on the body as they are experienced during the descent and ascent stages of a routine dive. Note that while these effects are described one after the other in sequence, in reality they occur simultaneously and affect the diver's body continuously. Firstly, the question of buoyancy. The physical law governing an object's buoyancy was first described by the ancient Greek mathematician Archimedes. Simply expressed, Archimedes' principle states that an object immersed in fluid experiences an upward force equal to the weight of the fluid it has displaced. Applying this principle to the fully equipped diver, when his weight in air is the same as the weight of water he displaces, he will be neutrally buoyant and will float. In order to descend, the diver must make himself negatively buoyant. This is achieved in two possible ways. First, by wearing a lead weight belt. And second, reducing the volume of his equipment by venting the gas trapped inside it so that he displaces less water. The second factor affecting the diver is one of squeeze on his body and equipment. When the diver enters the water and descends, the principal change from his normal surface environment is one of increasing pressure acting on all parts of his body. This hyperbaric pressure, as it is called, increases on him by one bar for every 10 meters that he descends. This increased pressure will not affect the fluids and solid tissues of his body, which, for all intents and purposes, are incompressible. It could, however, affect all those cavities in his body and equipment where gas is present, tending to squeeze them inwards if there is relatively lower pressure within. To understand this effect, we need to consider the physical law which governs the relationship of pressure to volume of a gas. Boyle's law states that, for a fixed mass of gas at a constant temperature, as the pressure increases, its volume will decrease in proportion, and vice versa. To illustrate Boyle's law, a container on the surface of the water will hold air at one bar absolute. At 10 meters, where the pressure has doubled to two bar absolute, the air in the container will be compressed to one half of its original volume. Pressure has doubled, causing the volume to halve. At 20 meters, where the pressure is three bar absolute, the air is compressed to one-third of its original volume, and at 30 meters, or 4 bar absolute, to one-quarter of its original volume, and so on. Displayed as a graph, we can see that the greatest change in volume takes place during the first 10 meters of descent. Thereafter, each additional 10 meters of depth produces a proportionately smaller and smaller change in the volume of gas. 
applying Boyle's law to the diver, this snorkel diver is breathing air at one bar absolute on the surface. When he dives to a depth of 10 meters, two bar absolute, the air in his lungs will be squeezed to one half of its original volume. The aqualung diver can overcome this squeeze on his lungs by using equipment which delivers gas at the same pressure as that of the surrounding water, therefore enabling his lungs to expand normally. So at 10 meters, the demand regulator delivers gas at 2 bar absolute. At 20 meters, it delivers it at 3 bar absolute, and so on. Always equalizing the pressure of the gas delivered with the water pressure surrounding the diver. While the regulator allows the diver to breathe at various depths with relative ease, it is important to know, however, that there is a price to be paid. As the diver goes deeper, the air breathed becomes more dense. He will therefore use his supply much more quickly at greater depths. At 20 meters, for example, the diver will breathe three times more gas for each breath taken than at the surface. At 30 meters, four times as much, and so on. Let us now look at the possible effects of increasing pressure on the other gas-filled cavities of the diver's body during descent. First, the ears. The external ear and the middle ear are divided by the ear drum, or tympanic membrane. The pressure on either side of this membrane is normally the same. Changes in pressure occurring externally are equalized by air passing up the eustachian tube, which links the middle ear to the throat. Divers restore the volume of the middle ear by using a procedure through which air is made to enter the middle ear via the eustachian tube. This is called clearing the ears. If for some reason air cannot reach the middle ear because of a blocked eustachian tube, then as a result of Boyle's law, as the pressure increases during descent, the volume of air within the cavity will decrease resulting in a painful inward bulging of the eardrum. In this situation, continued descent could result in rupture of the eardrum, and it is for this reason that a diver with a head cold, or who is unable to clear his ears, should not dive. Caution should always be exercised when attempting to clear the ears. The effect of this action is to increase pressure within the skull, which is then transmitted to another membrane, called the round window, which separates part of the inner ear from the middle ear. If this pressure becomes excessive through overvigorous attempts to clear the ears, the round window could literally blow out, causing a serious medical condition, known as round window fistula. Ear clearing should therefore always be performed gently. A further problem, aptly called reversed ears, can occasionally develop during descent, although it is far more common when returning to the surface. If the diver's hood is too tight, or the outer ear is blocked with wax, the pressure of gas in the external ear cannot increase. If the ears are then cleared, the eardrum will bulge, this time outwards, and once again cause considerable pain. The simple answer to this problem is never to wear a hood which fits too tightly, and also ensure the ears are kept free of wax. The sinus cavities of the cheekbone and forehead are subject to squeeze effects similar to those in the ears. Normally, pressure within the sinuses is maintained at ambient pressure via an opening which connects the sinus to the nasal cavity. If this opening becomes blocked, for example by an infection, then the hydrostatic pressure transmitted to the lining of the sinus will become greater than the air pressure within the sinus. This causes a painful swelling of the sinus lining and the small blood vessels within it will burst, causing bleeding into the sinus cavity. Once again, the warning is clear. If you have a head cold or a blocked nose, you should not die. Let us now turn to the remaining factor affecting an air diver's descent and look at the effects of pressure on the absorption of various gases by the blood and body tissues. As we have seen, 
The air we breathe on the surface is made up of about 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. According to another law of physics, Dalton's law, the total pressure of gas mixture equals the sum of the partial pressures of all the individual gases in it. Expressing this in terms of pressure, nitrogen is therefore 0.8 bar absolute and oxygen 0.2 bar. The proportion of the pressure for each gas is called its partial pressure. So, at a depth of 10 meters, where the pressure of air breathed is 2 bar absolute, the partial pressure of nitrogen will be approximately 1.6 bar absolute, and of oxygen, 0.4 bar. The proportions remain the same, 4 fifths and 1 fifth, and the partial pressures adding up to 2 bar absolute in total. Let us now consider how nitrogen is affected by changes in partial pressure. During the diver's descent, his body tissues and blood will be absorbing nitrogen. As the pressure increases, the more nitrogen is absorbed. So the deeper the diver goes, and the longer he stays down, the more nitrogen becomes dissolved in his body. While this process of absorbing nitrogen will do the diver no harm, a depth greater than about 30 meters where the partial pressure is 3.2 bar, nitrogen can have toxic effects on the body. These effects getting progressively more severe as depth increases. Nitrogen narcosis, as this condition is called, can produce a variety of subjective feelings, including dizziness, spinning sensations, buzzing in the ears, and a bitter metallic taste in the mouth many of them similar to those of alcohol intoxication. Yeah, it, it uh, varies, but generally, uh, dizziness, you convince that you're actually going round and round the road. Uh, although you're not, in fact, you can feel quite dizzy, light-headed. It's not a bad feeling. Um, generally, you know, as, as you sort of decrease your depth, it will then tend to disappear. As you go deeper, it gets worse. If you spot and concentrate, you can overcome the feeling. As long as you, you are aware it's happening, if you are aware it's happening to you, mm. you can combat it. But if, if you just forget what you're doing, then it will take charge of it. Trained, experienced divers can habituate to nitrogen narcosis by regular exposure, in much the same way as one can habituate to alcohol. Yeah, it's always like being done, yeah. For the inexperienced diver, however, the wisest course of action is to ascend as soon as narcosis becomes a problem. Oxygen, so vital to life, can become extremely toxic if breathed under pressure. At a partial pressure above about 0.5 bar absolute, oxygen will eventually become toxic to the lungs. At higher partial pressures, such as above about 2 bar absolute, oxygen can suddenly become toxic to the brain, causing convulsions and loss of consciousness. Thus, if the mixture being breathed has an oxygen content greater than that of air, the maximum safe depth at which the mixture can be used must be progressively reduced. A diver breathing 100% oxygen is therefore limited to a depth of only 7 meters to avoid the toxic effects of oxygen. Normally, the amount of carbon dioxide in exhaled air is only about 4%. In open circuit equipment such as this, carbon dioxide is exhaled along with other exhaust gases. Some types of diving equipment, however, employ a rebreathing system in which fewer bubbles are released. The carbon dioxide being extracted chemically by an absorbent material held in a special canister. If the correct drills are not carried out, or if the rebreathing equipment is faulty, carbon dioxide may not be properly extracted, and there is the potential for it to build up to a toxic level in the diver's tissue. Great down to the second time, bypass tested, ready for the water. Understood, put the in the water. Understood, in the water. The increased amount of carbon dioxide in the blood stimulates the respiratory centers, so that respiration increases rapidly. The diver experiences breathlessness coupled with a feeling of general distress and anxiety. It is very important that divers are able to recognize the symptoms of carbon dioxide poisoning and take appropriate action. Stop, rest, and when using a rebreather, 
flush through the counter run. If symptoms persist, all divers must return to the surface slowly in order to rest and breathe fresh air. The symptoms will then quickly disappear. The only after effect being a thumping headache. Carbon monoxide, even in trace quantities, can be lethal to the diver when breathed under pressure. Carbon monoxide produced within a faulty compressor or drawn in through a badly positioned air can find its way into the diver's air system. Red cells in the blood will take up carbon monoxide in preference to oxygen with the result that tissues become poisoned by absorbing carbon monoxide and are unable to utilize oxygen for internal respiration. As a consequence, the diver will experience headache, feel nausea and may vomit. Eventually, consciousness will be lost as the carbon monoxide progressively deprives his brain of oxygen. Diver on the Are you well? No, I don't feel well. I'm just scared. Right, get yourself up and in board. In this training exercise, a diver, supposedly suffering carbon monoxide poisoning, has been brought to the surface, where he is given pure oxygen under pressure in a recompression chamber. Diver on O2. Potentially the most hazardous part of the dive, the ascent. 
First, the ascending diver will be aware that the expanding gases trapped in his suit and certain items of equipment will cause an increase in his buoyancy. This is an application of both Boyle's law and Archimedes' principle, as the diver now weighs less than the weight of water he displaces. The diver needs to control the effect of the increased buoyancy, particularly during the final 10 meters, so that he does not rise too quickly, which may produce other, more serious problems. We have seen that as the diver descended, the gas-filled cavities in his body may be subjected to squeeze effect. During ascent, the expanding gas in these cavities has the reverse effect, again with the potential to cause tissue damage. For instance, reversed ears may occur if the eustachian tube blocks during the dive, thereby denying expanding gas within the middle ear a route of escape. This can then result in the eardrum being pushed painfully outwards. Sinus problems are more common during ascent than descent, and result once again from gas increasing its volume as pressure gradually decreases on the way up. If the opening leading from the sinus to the nasal cavity becomes blocked, the expanding volume of air trapped in the sinus will compress its mucosal lining, causing a reduction of its blood supply, which can be extremely painful and can last for a number of hours. As we know from our earlier consideration of Boyle's law, the volume of a quantity of gas at 10 meters depth will double when brought to the surface. For the diver, this means that any gas trapped behind an obstruction in his lungs will expand in the same way and may result in a burst lung. For example, expanding gas can burst into the bloodstream forming bubbles or gas emboli, which are carried by the circulation and, in the worst case, may cause blockage in the blood vessel supplying the heart or brain. Alternatively, the gas can rupture into the loose tissues that surround the airways and can then track into the space between the lungs and up into the base of the neck. Finally, the air may find its way into the pleural cavity which is the potential space between the lungs and the chest wall, causing a condition called pneumothorax. In this case, expansion of this escaped gas during ascent can collapse the lung. All three of these forms of burst lung can be serious, and in the case of gas embolism, may even cause sudden death, either during or within a few minutes of surfacing. It is essential, then, that the ascending diver should avoid anything which would obstruct the normal passage of air from his lungs, particularly during the final 10 meters of ascent. Breathing should be normal, and breath holding, for any reason, must be absolutely avoided. We have seen earlier in the program the diver descending to the bottom and carrying out his task inevitably absorbs inert gas, such as nitrogen, into his blood and tissues, as a result of the pressures acting upon him. The diver must eliminate most of this inert gas during a sense if he is to avoid problems caused by bubble pressure within his body, as the absorbed gas comes out of solution, producing a condition known as decompression, or, colloquially, the best. This is generally achieved by controlled the to the surface in accordance with an established decompression table. For example, a 20-minute dive to 30 meters does not require the diver to undergo any in-water stops. A 25-minute dive to 30 meters, however, will require the diver to stop at 3 meters for 5 minutes. This procedure is known as stage decompression. Decompression sickness is a term describing a group of illnesses ranging from slight discomfort and itchy skin to life-threatening brain disease. The treatment for someone suffering decompression sickness is recompression in a chamber where hyperbaric oxygen and fluids can be administered. However, prevention of decompression sickness by the correct use of an established table is by far the best treatment. I've heard the well. 
on the third raise the lazy shot to the surface. In this program, we have described the key laws of physics and physiology as they affect the diver's performance and safety. Because of a commitment to good diving practice and a determination to understand and apply the principles of diving safety as we have shown them here, serious diving accidents are very rare in the Royal Navy. As a result, a diver has been able to break through the constraining bounds of his natural environment and is privileged to explore and be part of a world which is available only to the very few. Well, 